Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Beat the Big Guys podcast. I'm Sandy Rosenthal, your host. And today is two things. It's not only is it the 41st episode of Beat the Big Guys podcast, but it's also the final episode of season four. It's been four marvelous seasons, and I'm already excited about season five. Today, my guest has I, let me let me check my notes. I almost couldn't believe my eyes. My guest has 48 years of experience. I mean, you want you want you want to know how to do something. This is the lady to ask. Her name is Wilma Subra. How are you, Wilma? I'm good. Thank you. I am so happy to have you on my show, and I can't wait to share with our listeners the work that you've been doing. But before I do that, there may be someone out there who doesn't know about Wilma Subra, and I'm going to tell them about you right now. So Wilma Subra is president of Subra Company. She provides technical assistance to citizens all across the country and in some foreign countries, too, who are concerned about their environment and human health. And as I mentioned, she's been doing this work for more than 48 years. Ms. Subra has completed a seven year term as vice chair of the EPA's National Advisory Council, a five year term on the National Advisory Committee of the US representative to the Commission for Environmental Cooperation and a six year term on the EPA National Environmental Justice Advisory. And this is just to name a few, I could go on and on, but we, we, we don't have enough time. Um, Ms. Subra has also received the MacArthur Fellowship Genius Award from the MacArthur Foundation, among many other awards, the list goes on and on. But currently, Ms. Subra, uh, Ms. but currently, Ms. Subra is currently focused on the environmental and human health impacts of shale development, a relatively new industry that's almost always or pretty much always involves hydraulic fracturing or what is more commonly known as fracking. Well, I'm so excited to know that you're involved with this work. And hello again, Wilma. Hello. Well, I saw on CNN, um, according to them, your biggest victory was in a fight against an oil waste incinerator in Amelia, Louisiana, that had been using hazardous waste or was going to use hazardous waste and toxic wood treatment waste as fuel. Um, is, is that right? Do you feel like that was your biggest victory? It was. It started out as incinerating oil field waste. And when they could not make enough money from that, they started adding hazardous waste and creosote waste from Superfund sites. And then they started taking hazardous waste from all over the United States and some foreign countries. And the control technology emission scrubbers were not adequate. And it was making everyone in the community very sick from the air emissions that were coming out of the stack. When so you said they started out doing one thing and then switched to another, did they basically fool fool everybody? Did they say we we're going to come in and do it one way and then they changed and did it a different way? They basically asked to have their permit changed, okay. and politically it was expedient to give them their permit change. And then while the Environmental Protection Agency was trying to do enforcement on it, they just kept expanding and expanding and expanding and enforcement usually takes quite a while. And so they opened up in 1984. Mm -hmm. And after about 15 years, the federal government shut them down and gave them two months to burn out all the waste that was there. And as a result of that, about three years ago, the last waste and the last groundwater contamination was finally remediated or cleaned up. So tell us um, a, a little bit more about your role in, in making this happy ending come about. Well, I provided technical assistance to the community groups that helped them understand what was going on and did a lot of presentations to federal government agencies as well as state government agencies and elected officials and helped them understand what was going on and associated the toxic chemicals to the health impacts that were occurring in St. Mary Parish. 
And as a result, everyone working together, they were finally able to get the federal judge to shut them down. And, and can you, I mean, this is all fascinating stuff. So how did you work together and how did you make this happen? Because obviously, clearly it didn't happen overnight. No, well, all the data is put up on a DEQ website. So you have access to all the sheets of paper. And then understanding what was going on and what kind of chemicals were in the oil field waste and then the creosote waste and the hazardous waste and getting that information out to the public and not just community members, but elected officials as well. And they realized that they were being poisoned. But what's interesting is because in, in, uh, in my experience, I've interviewed, um, for example, the, the name Ed, did the name Ed Bodker ring a bell with you? Yes, it does. So, so Ed Bodker, uh, he'd, he, he'd figured out, um, because he is an expert. I mean, he, he's not a, um, a he's not someone that's walked in, um, wasn't born yesterday, look at it that way. And he's an expert in biology. And he figured out that the, um, the waste treatment of, of uh, let, me, let me back up again. He figured out that this process whereby the, the companies were treating human waste and then pumping it back into the wetlands, it was supposed to rebuild wetlands. And actually it was actually destroying wetlands. And he figured this out. And he thought just by going to DEQ and telling them, he thought that would do it. He thought that would be enough. Well, no, no, if anything, um, all these companies making a lot of money with this process that doesn't work only ramped up uh, opposition. And it, it took several years. So, so, I, so what happened when the information was brought to bear, this information that you collected, when you first came forward with it, um, what was the initial reaction from the companies involved and from, from Department of Environmental Quality? Well, mostly the company just hired more experts mm -hmm. and more legal and then just kept fighting it. And while you're fighting it, you get to continue operating. And so as they continued operating, it was making more and more people sick and more and more data was accumulated. And I was able to get that data out. It, it's not like when you're driving and you're drunk and the cop stops you and he takes a test, then that he can give you a penalty. In this case, environmental issues take a very, very long time to make it through the legal process and have something required to either have them shut down or to change the methods they're using to clean up the air emissions, the water emissions, and the hazardous waste and contaminated soil. If you could, um, if you could pick a way, like the the cop stopping a drunk driver or a, a potentially drunk driver and giving them a test, I, I love that example. People understand it. There's nothing like a good example. But if you could choose a way for these companies that are are making people sick, okay, if you could choose a way that they could be um, found out and exposed and paid a penalty, what, what would you choose? Have you dreamed of such a, a, of, of an easy fix? Well, the environmental agencies can require fence line monitoring. And you just have to make sure that the chemicals they're looking for are the chemicals that they're releasing on the site. Mm -hmm. But then even with that data, in one case, we have one facility in St. John the Baptist Parish, we have data back all the way to 2016, samples were collected every three days. We showed it was way over the standards and they are challenging the standard. The industry is challenging the standards. So meanwhile, they get to keep operating. And that's the issue is you need enforcement and you need enforcement in a timely manner. And that Not comes with- Five, 10, 20 years later while they continue to operate. Right. Um, I totally agreed. And that means changing laws. That, that means lo the law or changing, lawsuit or changing rules and regulations, changing that rules, make up the laws. And, and can uh, are voters like me involved in that process? I mean, can I vote to, for, for, for my legislators to change the rules or, or can yes. I? OK, I can. So there is something I can do. Yes, you can require that the communities ask their legislators to adopt appropriate rules and regulations to enforce 
the rules and make that enforcement in a timely manner. But, but that is encouraging. So when, when um, it, the, this company um, in Amelia, um, does, it what, does it have a name or was it several companies working together? This uh, oil waste incinerator. No, it was one company. It was called Marine Shale Processors. Marine Shale Processors. So when Marine Shale, so Marine Shale Processors uh, began their, their work, which they claimed was going to be a certain way, that then they started um, using Superfund material. Uh, goodness, I'm, I'm, going to maybe, I'm going to be having nightmares tonight. Uh, so, so when they started doing that, how, about how many years lapsed between this starting and when they finally were told you can't do this anymore? 15. 15 years, which is, that, that's not surprising to me. It, it's, 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 it's awful, but it's not surprising to me. And, I, and clearly your work uh, in exposing these dangerous levels of chemicals was important. Um, what else, what other, that, like if that was very important, what else do you think was important in addition to just putting that information out there? Because as we both know, that's not enough. Just, just the telling them the truth isn't enough. Right, the community involvement. The community, community involvement. Understood mm -hmm. that data and participated in all the public hearings and documented all the situations called to DEQ when they were older events or when they were emission events, called them in and documented to DEQ what was going on. Because even if God himself had come down to you, Wilma, with the truth, and you had gone to the proper people who can do something about it, that wouldn't have been enough. You had to have the community as well. You have to have the community mm -hmm. because if, you, if you're fighting it and, and you're not fighting it on behalf of the community, then you can have the financial aspects going on. And people are saying, but they hire all these people. They give them jobs. Mm -hmm. they, they did like a Christmas party for all the children and Santa was sitting in front of a tanker railroad tanker car with hazardous waste giving out gifts to the children wow to talk about a visual yes. but then but then the community can have their visuals too and, and we'll we'll talk about that later so how did you get involved with the community. I mean, the community needed you and you needed the community. So what brought you together? In that case, it was a parish council member that was a friend of my family. Mm -hmm. And he went to my mother and he said, Wilma needs to look into this. <laughs> and so I set up a meeting and went on the site for a site visit. And I knew all the people in town. That's where I grew up. And so then we started having community meetings mm -hmm. with the community members that I knew. And then the mayor got involved and the city council was involved and the parish council was involved. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. So the, I, I thought that was fascinating. Uh, Wilma, are you familiar with this book, uh, Robert Ballot, um, Exposure? I am. And, okay, so what's interesting is he, his mother, the lawyer that took on this case, um, it's because the community people who were affected initially um, went to his mother mm -hmm. and his mother called her son and said, you need to help those people. Exactly. exactly. Uh, so, um, and abs absolutely how things work. And you know what, as long as they got brought together, uh, it was a connection, but it was also, um, you know, pe people are connected. And, oh. and uh, so it's so good that that, that that worked out. Now, there was some one other thing you mentioned that I thought, thought was, oh, yes, when, so the, I, the, I, I love that imagery of the cop stopping someone and, and instantly there's a penalty, the instant test and instant penalty. And, and I, it, and that's really important for um, someone like yourself and the community to have a clear visual that people can understand. Well, when they experience mm -hmm. odors or emissions or smoke mm -hmm. and they call the 
police department and the police comes out or the fireman comes out and they're standing on the edge of the road by a facility, they are able to communicate directly with those law enforcement agencies mm -hmm. about what they're experiencing and have them document it. And it goes in the file. And that's a clear visual. That's something clear that people can understand. I, the, the battle, I, I mean, I certainly remember when I stood, started you know, trying to sound the horn uh, about the Army Corps of Engineers, I felt so alone and, and felt so like I was a character in a B-weight movie. And a, a friend of mine a, a who became a colleague that helped me with advice at, when I was feeling down, he said, you know, he said, imagine life as a cornfield, this huge cornfield, and you're trying to get the word out. And, you're and he said, you don't have to be 10 feet higher than the other corn stalks. You only have to be a little bit higher and everyone's going to see you. And, he, and, and so his, and what he was trying to say is you don't have to be the best at everything. Just do, do one thing a little bit better uh, than the others and you'll get noticed. And, and it, not everything you try will work. I mean, can, can, you, can you think of a time that uh, something that you thought would be a slam dunk and, and it didn't, didn't go anywhere? I mean, I, I know I have. If you, if, you, if you can't think of one, I'll give one of my own. Well, a lot of times the community will ask me to come in and help them. Mm -hmm. And I put the data together. I educate and empower them. And then we go to like a zoning meeting where it's going to be rezoned. And clearly there was enough information that the people who lived around it didn't want those emissions mm -hmm. if they were rezoned and they went ahead and rezoned. And then those people were the ones turning in complaints the whole time a facility was operating. And you'll see that a lot, especially north of Lake Pontchartrain where they'll put in concrete facilities because they have a big project and the concrete facilities release lots and lots of particulate matter. And you'll see people there fighting, having it zoned to allow it to be located there, even though it might be only there for two or three years. And then you have them watching constantly and turning in complaints. And it's just that kind of thing is like keeping tabs on what is going on in your neighborhood. And so what would you say to our listeners, you know, if that happened to them? And, and, and I've been in that position where I, I really thought that, that just uh, not liking something would be enough to stop it. And, and it wasn't. Uh, what, what can you say to our listeners to, to help them move on after something like that happens? Well, first of all, before it happens, when you find out something's new or being proposed, you need to start looking into it and gathering information. And then as you work on it, if it does come to pass that they allow it to be constructed, then you need to have a group like a neighborhood watch and monitoring. There's a, a facility that releases red mud on the Mississippi River and there's Pelican Point subdivision right next to it. And people were complaining that the red mud was getting all over their houses, their cars, in their yards, all over their shrubs and all. And the facility wasn't doing what their permit agreed to do. Mm -hmm. So they asked me to go out and I gave them a form. And I said, if you start filling out the form and you start calling the parish council and doing those complaints because Pelican Point is a really exclusive neighborhood and they shouldn't have to live with all this red dust being deposited on them all the time. And that will make a difference if a number of people, and they said, oh, well, we have a really good neighborhood watch. I said, well, distribute these forms and distribute that information through them and have everybody in the neighborhood start calling in. And the, the really tragic part is people that lived in Bayou Corn and were relocated, some of them moved to Pelican Point. And now they have the red dust issue. At, at times, even when you win um, a battle, you, you, sometimes it can be a little disheartening to see there's just another battle down the road uh, and, and it kind of never quite starts. But you know, it's, it, I also think it's really important you know, to savor the victories. Every, every victory, and and I, speaking for myself, I know there were many times that 
I, I was just too busy thinking about the work we still needed to do that, mm -hmm. that I didn't celebrate the, the victories along the way. It wasn't until I started sitting down to write my book that, that uh, if I can talk about my book for just, just a second, that I, I see all these things we'd accomplished. I totally forgot about it. I just totally forgot about it and was so focused on the big, big picture. And I, I really think it is very important for all of you, you know, to celebrate every victory because each victory lets your supporters know that their time and effort working on this goal is time well spent, even but if it's a small victory. Is the community thinks if they celebrate then it's going to undo the situation and something else is going to pop up and so they say we really shouldn't celebrate because we have other issues but you're right you should celebrate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely it and it it gives and on another thing that uh for example i i see um Ms. Uh, I, 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 it's Wilma. For me, it's Ms. Suba, but um, she, Ms. Suba insists I call her Wilma. So you have all these awards, okay? And the MacArthur Fellowship Genius Award, you have all these amazing awards. And, but, and it's important when awards like this are, are received that you I'll, I'll let everybody know, let everyone who works with you know about those awards because that will be evidence that their support uh, of you and your work is time well spent. Yes. E even also, even though it might make you feel a little little when, funny because that's a, not why you did the work. No, why when a permit gets denied for that community, that is the most critical thing for that community that that facility will not be bought and constructed and operate in their community. Well, well on that note, I probably wouldn't advertise that I'd won an award on the day that a permit gets denied or a permit doesn't, you, know, you might want to time it a little bit, but, but oh. I had this exact problem um, how, when I had received some sort of recognition for the work of levies.org, not the work I did, but for the organization. Uh, I said, well, what do I do with this information? And uh, another advisor of mine told me, you absolutely tell all your supporters. And, and, and not only is it their time has been well invested supporting you, any, any donations they might have sent you, that would be evident that those donations is paying off. Uh, so you absolutely should tell anybody who's supporting your work that you'd receive some sort of recognition, even though, you know, I didn't do it and you didn't do it. We, did, we don't do our work for the awards. Right. We do no. it because there's a need to provide information on the situations that are occurring in their communities. Absolutely. And, and in addition to um, all of that, I lost my train of thought, what was I going to say about the awards? Um, oh, Don, it was important too. Give me one second. I've lost it, but maybe, maybe I'll think of it before we close, but, but awards are, oh, I remember what it was. Okay, Jess, I'm starting now. Uh, and one last thing about um, awards is they bring credibility. You know, especially if you're new, I mean, I mean, Wilma, you've been at this work for so long, so you've you've got your track record and uh, and people aren't going to doubt your credibility. But someone who's recently begun b working on beating the big guys and doing something in their neighborhood, if along comes an award that brings credibility it and does. the credibility is good no matter how you shake it. So right. so uh, uh, embrace awards and and properly properly spoken about you know spoken mm -hmm. about with humility can bring very very good things for your cause no matter what your cause is Correct. so wilma is it any um it actually I'm, st I'm stopping again jess and restarting if anybody is um it's certainly me i'm when i did my research about you i i, I there's so many things about you i didn't know and if for people like me uh, and other listeners, if we want to follow your work and put, and know more about it, or maybe even get invol involved, what would you suggest we do? So if you want to know about my work, you can Google me. Okay. I did a presentation for uh, Blacks and Energy many years ago, and I had worked with some of the executive members of that organization. And 
I go to the presentation, I've got my PowerPoint, and I'm part of a panel. And then the um, head guy says, and I'm going to introduce you based on what I found out about Wilma on the internet. And I'm going like, what did he find out on the internet about me? And he found out good things about me. But that was the first time. And then I started paying attention that what I did, how much of that gets on the internet. Speaking but of that's internet. that's where you can find the kind of problems I work on. And even if you can't find the issue that you're involved in, that doesn't mean I can't help you. Speaking of internet, I, uh, I just remembered that, uh, is it true you were actually shot at, at your office? I had a drive-by shooting at my office, yes. Wow, and, and you were, I, so I understand that you were in your office at the time. In my office working by the window. And after I had a security individual come in and he said, move away from the front window, move your desk to the back. Did you? I did. Well, I'm, well, we want to keep you with us for as long as possible. So I'm glad you moved your desk to the back. But I am, I am proud to know you that even after that, you kept with your work and you kept with your focus and now involved more than ever uh, with the, with this shale, uh, shale, re shale development issue. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Do you um, have any um, last gems that you'd like to share with our listeners before we sign off for today? Citizens can always make a difference. Even if you think you can't, find out what the issue is, do a little research and start putting your brain towards telling people what's being proposed, what's going on, or what contamination is there, and getting the agencies to help you address those issues. Citizens can make a huge difference. Rah, rah, citizens definitely can. Well, well, thank you, Wilma Subra. I hope you all enjoyed this episode. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and review this podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you too can beat the big guys. Okay, stay with me. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. And let me just stop recording and